Yes. Um, sorry, just before I start with the questions, I think yesterday I suggested that um, when looking at the leaflets um, and the delay, that Dr. Wolford had described the delay as unconscionable and Lord Glenartha is much too long. In fact, it was the other way round. Dr. Wolford used the term unconscionable to describe the delay in relation to decision making on BPL. Uh, in relation to the leaflet, she said, much too long. Um, and it was Lord Glenarthur um, who um, used um, and then uh, associated himself with the use of the word unconscionable in relation to the leaflet. So I just wanted to correct that, um, that it was the other way around. Thank you. Um, Lord Clark, I want to ask you to look uh, at two statements you made, one in a press release and one in Parliament, and then ask you some questions about okay. it. So the press release of the 1st of September is at DHSC 0006401 underscore 006. That's 1st of September. 1983, my yeah. So this is the press release, in fact, the press release in relation to the publication of the leaflet, um, 1st of September, 1983. Is this the first uh, leaflet? This is the first leaflet. Uh, and I'm not going back to the saga of the leaflet, Lord Clark, but it's to see what was said about the causal link between AIDS and blood products. Oh, yes, right. So it, the, the, leaf, the press release reads, the Department of Health and Social Security has today published a leaflet, AIDS and how it concerns blood donors. It has been produced in cooperation with the regional blood transfusion directors. Announcing publication, Kenneth Clark, Minister for Health, said, it has been suggested that AIDS may be transmitted in blood or blood products. There is no conclusive proof that this is so. Nevertheless, I can well appreciate the concern that this suggestion may cause we must continue to minimise any possible risk of transmission of the disease by blood donation, but it is not possible to test a person's blood for the presence of AIDS. The best measure which can be taken at the present time is to ask people who think they may have AIDS or be at risk from it to refrain from giving blood. This is what this leaflet sets out to do. So pausing there, Lord Clark, and just so that you know where, where um, uh, the questions are going to be uh, heading, I'm going to be asking you in a few minutes, once we've looked at some other documents, about the use of the phrase no conclusive proof. But we can see it set out there. Um, and I just want to see what advance notice you had of the press release by looking at a couple of other documents. So if we look at DHSC 0002, 2309 underscore 034. Um, this is um, um, a document uh, which um, <coughs> uh, is a minute of the 26th of August 1983 from your private office, Mr. Naismith, to Mr. Wynne Stanley in the Health Services uh, Division. Yes, you showed me this yesterday. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the, the purpose of showing you this again is, is simply that we can see from the first paragraph that you've been shown a question and answer briefing and the press statement prepared. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, again, I, I, can, I can take you to... And that was obviously... I was told about that obviously in the background briefing that would have accompanied the draft press notice I was given. In, in, indeed, and um, we should have that. I think it's the next few pages. Let me just double-check. Um, uh, yes, if we turn over the page, we can see this is the text of a, the draft statement that you were approving. Um, it, it, it's not 100% identical to the, to the final press um, statement, but in terms of the relevant passages, uh, um, uh, it, there's no, I think, material difference. So you'll see the draft statement being submitted to you, end of the second line, it has been suggested that AIDS may be transmitted in blood or blood products. There is no conclusive proof that this is so. Yes, it's, Nevertheless, a, it's, it's essentially the same. It's essentially, yes. Um, and if we just go, um, I think for the sake of completeness, through the question and answer brief that you were um, also being sent, which is on the next page, there are... Uh, is there a page before that, Shamu? Do we get a third page? 
that's it. So there are a number of references in this document to the phrase no conclusive evidence or no conclusive proof, proof and I'm just going to highlight those. So we can see paragraph two, what is being done to protect haemophiliacs I must emphasise that there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products, uh, but there is no means of testing for the presence of AIDS, etc. Um, so that's there. If we go over the page to the bottom of the next page, at the, at the bottom, the suggested question and answer for what is the government doing to stop imports of Factor VIII from America, I must emphasise that there's no conclusive evidence that AIDS has been transmitted by American blood products. Factor VIII is essential to the treatment of many haemophiliacs and the possible risk of infection from AIDS must be balanced against the obvious risks of not having enough factor VIII. And then if we go to the next page, paragraph 21, halfway down the page, the question, why issue a leaflet at all? The, the suggested answer that's being given to you by way of briefing is, while there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood or blood products, we believe that it is right that blood donors should be fully informed about AIDS, and we've produced an information leaflet for blood donors which asks those who think they may have had AIDS or be at risk from it not to donate blood. Could we just go back to the, the first of those, uh, those pages, the Q&A brief? Page three of the document, Jamie. It's, uh, it's number three. Uh, is anything known about the means of transmission? The mechanisms by which the disease is transmitted and the causative agent or agents are not known. However, most of the blank cases in this country have occurred in male homosexuals or intravenous drug abusers. This is consistent with the pattern observed in other countries. So th there's nothing known about the way in which it's transmitted, but nonetheless, to avoid the risk, one should not take blood uh, from those who might be in those high-risk groups. That, that would appear to be the thrust of, of, of that, that part of the message, so yes. Um, so, Lord Clark, if we just go back to the first page of the document, I, I think, would it be right to understand from what's set out by your private office in the first paragraph, you, you saw the draft press statement, you saw the question and answer briefing? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I, I would if I without a question. Um, so that, that's it would be put out in my name because I was m much better known uh, to the media and to the public that, uh, because <laughs> all, the, all the controversies I was in the middle of in the health service, as one always is in the health service, uh, than Simon was. And I was also more accustomed, if any interviews arose, to doing interviews. And so as they, in order to get more publicity, actually, they would tend to put it out in my name. Um, but I, I wasn't the author of any of this. Um, um, and um, again, just so that we can um, follow through the trail of documents, if we just look at DHSC 0002321 underscore 034. It's a document we looked at yesterday, and so I'm just going back to it for another purpose now. So this, this was the minutes from your office on the 31st of August 1983, again about the uh, issue in relation to the first leaflet. Um, um, but we can well, see... I have seen this before. We, we did look at it yesterday, Lord Clark. Um, paragraph 2, um, uh, I've now spoken to MSH, who's commented as follows. Yes, I, we had this yesterday. Yes. I obviously had forgotten. And I, I was obviously slightly apologised. I'd forgotten that I had earlier agreed with what I was now uh, being worried by. Yes. And the purpose for going back to it today, Lord Clark, is just to look at the second paragraph of your comments where you say, subject to any last-minute views by Lord Glenarth, I'm content for us to proceed on this basis, the press notice can be issued with the minor amendments I have made. So you've... Uh, um, uh, precisely what those minor amendments are, I don't think we know, but I don't think... Because we haven't got the original documents, I've no. um, uh, But in any event, can it be taken from that, that, that you, are, you are positively approving the terms of the press notice, are you not? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't... I wouldn't they wouldn't put out a press notice in my name without my having approved it nor would they answer a written... I mean, I would have to clear a press notice being put out in my name, just like a written question. I would have to clear the answer. I, I, nothing, nothing was put out without... or should not and should never have been, and don't think ever was. So nothing should be put out in my name without my actually signing up to it. Um, and then, um, uh, final document in relation to the September press release is at DHSC 000... 
2321 underscore 031. This is a minute which we didn't look at yesterday and which I don't think would have come across your desk. It's the 2nd of August 1983 from Mr. Parker to Dr. Wolford. Um, what it refers to in the second paragraph is, is um, a paragraph from one of the ministerial submissions um, uh, uh, um, uh, had been missing, um, and so the relevant paragraph is attached. I just want to go over the page and see what that paragraph was, again, just so that we can see what the department's thinking was in relation to, to the press statement. This is from D uh, Mr. Parker Mr. to Parker Diana Walford. Mm. That's right. And I I if we just go to the second page, this That's was the paragraph idea. that had been missing from uh, one of the submissions sent to you, and I think uh, sent to Lord Glenarth, and I think you. Um, the draft ministerial statement, so that's the press statement enclosed, is low key, puts the problem of AIDS into perspective and justifies the leaflet initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if ministers agree that the leaflet should now be printed, it should be ready for publication by the middle of August. And the statement could be incorporated in a press release to coincide with this. And we've seen that that was done. The question arises, however, as to whether there is any need to publicize the leaflets available Arguments for a statement, so this is an argument for the, a statement to be released by, by you, would appear to be... Yes, this is why we're putting out a press release. Exactly. A... It seems to have succeeded with headlines like, Doc's ban gay blood. Um, so um, the, um, the reasons being set out for a press release or press a statement for ministers, political and media interest, including Lord Glen Arthur's statement in the Lords that we're considering a leaflet, points to the need for a statement during the recess... B, the need for the government to be seen to be taking a oh, positive yeah. step in an area where, because of the lack of knowledge of the cause of the disease and its treatment, there is limited scope for action. So would it be right to understand, and again, I'm conscious you, you probably didn't see this at the time, um, but, but I anticipate there may be nothing here that surprises you. It's being suggested here that there are two reasons for putting out a statement, a press notice. One is political and media interest, and the other is to show that the government is taking a positive step. Mm -hmm. um, I, so don't, I don't. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah. No, I, don't, I, I think you probably haven't. Um, so that that was the, the 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 first time you used the phrase. I think no conclusive proof. The, the second, which we carried on using for quite a long time. Yes, and we'll just we'll just look at the second time you used it. I've already asked Lord Glenarthur about the occasions he. Well, used it was used it. by all the ministers it, it repeatedly indeed. for many months. We're not going to go through them all. I no, think. we're going to go simply through the two statements that you made, Lord Clark. PRSE. 0000886. Uh, and you'll see if we zoom in towards the top half of the page, um, this is a written parlementary answer on the this 14th. Is a, this is Hansard, yeah. Yes, 14th of November 1983. And then if we look top right hand corner under the heading Blood Products Imports, Mrs. Curry asked the Secretary of State for Social Services what advice has been given to hospitals concerning the use of imported Factor 8 in the light of recent concern about its possible contamination with the causative agent of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And then here is your written response. There is no conclusive evidence that acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, is transmitted by blood products. The use of factor VIII concentrates is confined almost exclusively to designated haemophilia centres whose directors and staff are expert in this field. Professional advice has been made available to all such centres in relation to the possible risks of AIDS from this material. Right. Now, but before we come back to the use of the phrase no conclusive evidence or no conclusive proof, I just want to ask you about what's said in the last sentence of, 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 of the written answer. Um, and I think I'm right in understanding we don't have the briefing documents um, that would have well, that makes it uh, difficult, been it? provided to you. Um, uh, but you, I, I think you addressed this in your statement and we'll have a look at it. So um, um, pro professional advice has been made available to all such centres in relation to the possible risks of AIDS from this material. Would you, looking at that now, would you have understood that to be a reference to professional advice being made available by... The government, or not? Well, one might, but it doesn't, you know, you, so if you wanted to know, that's a question you'd ask, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, I, I might, but it, 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 doesn't, it isn't altogether clear, I agree. I say that the, the, the real, the decisions that mattered had to be taken by these haemophilia doctors. 
I mean, that's where the key decisions were taken. And they would rely on, firstly, the, the professional conferences. They'd all explain, uh, they'd all have views. They'd rely on the medical journals and keeping up to date in their specialty. And they rely on anything else that was put out by way of advice, including advice from the department. And I obviously, uh, w with the draft thing, was told that professional advice had made, been made available to all the haemophilia centres. And, and just so that we can see what, what you've said about this in your witness statement, Shame, it could we have Lord Clark's first statement up on screen, WITN 0758, you're ahead of me, thank you, page 90. As you will see, we, we, we are, every day we would ask, answer large numbers of written yes. questions on every subject under the sun that was in our department. So it's the bottom of the page, paragraph 7.117. I am asked what the professional advice was that was made available to the designated haemophilia centres in relation to the possible risks of AIDS from this factor eight concentrates. In the absence of having seen the explanatory brief which would have accompanied a draft of this answer, I cannot say what information about this was provided to me at the time. So you, you don't know what that's based on, in other words, that statement in, in hand. No, I can't remember. I mean, after 40 years, I can't remember what explanation the brief gave. No, the and it, it, it's, it's one of the number one of sentence in a written answer. Yes, and, and it's one of the number of briefs that, are, that have not been located. You go on to say this. However, I understand that on the 24th of June 1983, the Chairman and Secretary of the UK Haemophilia Centre Directors Organisation, Professor Bloom and Dr Ritzer, wrote to all Haemophilia Centre Directors, summarising the discussions at a meeting of the UK Haemophilia Reference Centre Directors on the 13th of May 1983. Um, and, and then you say in the last sentence, I am further informed that this advice continued to be discussed and kept under review yes. by the UK. This was, this was by the Department of Health legal team who drafted and answers questions. I, I, didn't go, I didn't produce these hundreds of, of answers to hundreds of questions. They, 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 we gave as full answers as we could uh, in order to try to be helpful. And so when I say understand, it was the legal people working on this who told me that. I'm sure they did it in order to be helpful. And the legal people, I mean, I hadn't heard of this until, really, until you, know, you asked a question. I'd forgotten I'd ever answered this written question. That, 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 that's really what I wanted to understand, Lord Clark. Um, when you refer, <coughs> excuse me, when you refer in your statement to this June letter, and I, I can put it up on screen. Yeah, I've never seen the June letter. You hadn't seen it at the time. Is it, is it right? This is being suggested now as possibly material that you're not supposed Well, I might have seen it then. I mean, one of the daft things about this is you're asking such detail about events 40 years ago in a busy government department where this was a tiny, tiny proportion of my activity. And I'm sorry, but the, truth, the, the only truthful answer I can give is that right now, 40 years later, I haven't a clue whether I then saw the letter from the chairman and secretary of the Haemophilia Society. If I told you I had or hadn't, you very sensibly would not believe me. You wouldn't believe I could remember that. It's, you know, with great respect, it's, it's quite obvious that it, no one can answer these questions. That's, we're, we're engaged in historical research here with the elderly survivors, uh, the ones that haven't died so far, uh, of those who were in the department at the time, and in meticulous detail, which is inconceivable that any witness could possibly remember. This was true for half of yesterday. Uh, Lord, Lord Clark... Um, if you've got the documents, why don't you use the documents? Lord, Lord Clark, it, it's, uh, it's quite useful for me uh, to know, because you yourself have said a moment or two ago that the central decisions were taken by the traditions who were treating individuals. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and this uh, press release says that they had been given professional guidance. So you understand, it's quite useful yeah, for they, us. They were specialist haemophilia doctors. They, uh, were the, they, they were the world's experts on the whole subject. It's quite useful for us as an inquiry to know what the professional guidance was. Uh, and well, you, no, you no, yourself... I agree, I agree. well, you, you, I, I understand that, but expecting me to remember 
content of letters that I might or might not have seen 40 years ago, with great respect, is slightly wasting time. Bear, bear with me for a moment. I, I think the point that Council was uh, exploring, as I understand it, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, was that this part of your statement isn't actually coming from recollection, because no one would expect you yes, to remember as I, as, as I say, it, 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 it begins by saying, I cannot say what information about this was provided to me at the time. Uh, and the That's information, the therefore, that is now, put... I, I, I thought it was... I did obviously agree with the people helping me draft the answers that it might be helpful to add information which they told me about which was that this, this letter had been sent and so on. I think what is particularly helpful to me about that is that the best that those advising you at the time when you made this statement could do by way of identifying any form of professional advice uh, is to refer to the um, letter on the 24th of June 1983 and to nothing else. Well, I don't know how many documents are left by which they could research what had been done. It, it, the, the letter means something to us for other evidence that we've had in this inquiry. Uh, and it's, it is a, a support, I think, for the inquiry's conclusion that it can find no other reference to any other professional advice. That was the point you were making, was it? In, 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 indeed, sir. Uh, and conscious um, that Lord Clark, Lord Clark has identified this particular letter in a witness statement uh, to which he has signed and attested a statement of truth. Uh, and it, it is. And it, that should admit, what we don't know is how many documents have, which documents have been kept, and which haven't from that time. The real, the if you want the full answer that, to what happened in 1983 and what advice went to, is unless you've got some direct evidence who, from someone who claims to remember, nobody knows. All you can do is do your best from such documents as still survive. In, indeed. Lord Clark, you've referred to the difficulty. Well, you're doing historical research, really, in such documents as you've been able to recover, thousands of them. You've referred to the difficulty of, of an inquiry investigating matters decades later. Um, uh, this is an issue which we may touch on when we look at your involvement as Secretary of State for Health but, um, um, and the haemophilia litigation. Can you recall whether you gave consideration to the possibility of establishing an inquiry rather closer in time to the events when you were Secretary of State for Health, when everything would have been no, fresh I, in everyone's the, mind? The, we didn't have these public inquiries then. Anything they were, I can't remember when it started, this habit of having them. Uh, but, but no, I, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Uh, there, there were inquiries. There have been two inquiries already. But they were set up by people outside the department. There was one, I can't remember who held them now, there's one in Scotland. And there was an English one as well. It's Lord Archer's inquiry. Uh, from, they unfortunately, right. <coughs> came to the wrong. Both came to the wrong conclusion from the point of view of the campaigners. I didn't give evidence to either, because I wasn't the minister responsible. So they couldn't see the need for calling me. Um, can I ask you to look um, at a, another paragraph in your witness statement, please? Shame if it's page eighty-nine of the witness statement. Paragraph 7.113, um, you, you refer in, in the, your answer to a memo from um, um, uh, uh, Ms. Sabellis to Dr. Field relating to known AIDS cases as of the 9th of September 1983, which included the information that two patients were haemophiliacs who'd received American Factor VIII. Um, I'm not going to, unless you want me to take you to that, you say that you would probably not have seen that, that table at the time. But you then go on to say this, however, from memory, it was not clear at the time that the very few haemophiliacs that were being reported to have contracted AIDS at this stage had contracted it from their treatment for haemophilia, as opposed to by other means, as other AIDS patients had, for example, through sexual activity. It was only when reports of haemophiliacs being infected in much higher numbers came to light that the position became clearer. Is it right to understand from that, Lord Clark, that in terms of your thinking in autumn of 1983, you understood that it might be the case that the haemophiliac cases were actually cases of people who had contracted AIDS through sexual activity and not their treatment? Well, that, that obviously was a possibility. Until, as I, as I go on to say... Once it became obvious that haemophiliacs were suddenly the numbers increased and they were disproportionately being affected, 
Um, there's no reason to believe that the uh, uh, haemophiliacs are any different than any other members of the public in terms of their personal relationships and so on. So when you've only got one or two, three perhaps, it is just possible that, that you know, as you're beginning to acquire other people who had acquired AIDS, uh, as other people, so one or two of the people getting AIDS were haemophiliacs. That was what, it was one possibility. I mean, that's not the only reason uh, why it was unclear at first. But the, the, the opinion of the medical profession was it was unclear. Uh, that's why they didn't stop giving the treatment. I, I'm, I know I'll be corrected by your legal team if I'm wrong when I say this, Lord Clark. I don't think we've seen any evidence from within the department, documentary or otherwise, to suggest that it was being um, ad advanced or considered that the cases that were known about, Cardiff case and other cases, w were thought to be anything other than cases uh, caused by a treatment for haemophilia rather than sexual activity on well, the part of the individual. The, 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 the scientific and medical advice we got is summed up the phrase, there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted. Well, well, whatever it is. That, uh, but you, uh, you seem to be recalling in this paragraph of your witness statement um, a, a, a positive recollection that this was uh, something that was at least going through your mind uh, at the well, time? Well, I, 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 yes, I mean, not, not, I don't have some stark reflections of any discussion about it, but it seems to be obvious when you get the first one or two uh, and they're haemophiliacs, I mean, for, for anybody, the first question you ask is, is this case any different from other cases we have? I mean, just the fact that the patient has the misfortune of being a haemophiliac actually mean that the way they've caught AIDS is any different to anybody else. I mean, it's, it seems to be a, a, a perfectly obvious question that would cross anybody's mind when you had the first one or two cases. Do you think you would have asked that question of the, the Oh, I can't remember department? what question. Again, as I, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I should have, I, 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 I must uh, not, not I shouldn't, shouldn't be quite so combative, but you know, as, I, as I said a few moments ago, I can't conceivably remember details of conversations from 40 years ago on such an offbeat subject. No, but you say it was a perfectly obvious question, and so I appreciate entirely you can't remember as a matter of fact no. whether you asked it, but it, if, if it's an obvious question to your mind, do you think it's likely that you would have asked it? I have no idea. I just don't know whether I'd have the opportunity. How on earth could you, if you only got, let's say you've only got one case, how on earth could you be certain this was the, that this case was not sexually transmitted like all the others. And that no one could possibly have come to that conclusion. Why use the phrase no conclusive proof or no conclusive evidence in the first place? Well, has anybody found any record of the meeting where the medics and scientists agreed on that? No. It was... Because it came, it wasn't drafted by a minister... Our advice, what well, the advice to us was, and the phrase they obviously, we obviously, I can't remember us doing it, but somebody somewhere decided that that was the best, most accurate line to take. And so, we, as as I discovered when answering your questions, again, it was repeatedly used by every minister, as as it were, obviously to been settled on by somebody, as the best, most accurate line to describe where we were and you know ordinary use of the English language it plainly meant uh, there's a strong possibility but at the moment there's we can't be certain or sure and we kept repeating that uh, because that was the scientific advice we had until whenever it was a few months later when it was becoming increasingly clear to the medics that there, there was in fact sufficient proof to be pretty certain that they were being transmitted. But we, we weren't playing down the, the possibility, indeed the probability, because the background, the context of it all, was we were putting out a leaflet asking gay people not to give blood and not only getting reported, but getting rather sensationalised reporting in bits of the press for doing so, because it was quite... I can't think of any, well, you immediately find some precedent, but off the cuff now, I can't think of any precedent for such a dramatic thing 
as telling a particular section of the population to stop donating blood to the health service. And the, 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 the phrase we used to explain the medical background was, you know, there's a, we're doing this because there's a strong possibility that it's transmitting AIDS, but it's, well, it's, we can't be certain or sure about that. Dr. Wilfred. It's perfectly accurate, the phrase. It seems to me, from what I'm looking at it now, and I've seen these documents, it's a perfectly accurate description of where medical opinion was. That's presumably why the, the real experts, the haemophilia doctors, were still using factor eight. D Dr. Wolford told us that um, it, it was her own view that, 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 that blood, blood products were a likely cause of transmission. A likely cause, yes from early 1983, and that that was the mainstream view within the department um, really by the middle of 1983. Can you help us with, with understanding why then the line to take was not, it is likely that AIDS is caused by transmission. Well, we tend to go on to say there is a possibility, it can't be ruled out. I, I don't know. Only Diana Wolfe could answer that. She, she, she would certainly have been involved in any meeting which, which settled this line to take. Minister, ministers, I mean, it's true today in COVID, you know, ministers protest this publicly now. On clinical matters, scientific matters, any sensible minister has to be guided strongly by the advice you get from the clinical and scientific experts. You, you don't start inventing your own medical opinion. And, and you may challenge it if something very startling is put to you. Know, is that really so? And he even said, surely this last week you told me X or something like that. My habit was, you know, I think, rather to do that sometimes. As you see from the documents, sometimes I'm asking questions. That's, that's your role, that's your duty, and that's certainly what I used to do. But you, you don't start substituting your own amateur medical opinion for that of the experts, including, presumably, the experts who've consulted specialists in the whole field of haemophilia and specialists in the subject of AIDS. The ministers, no minister can possibly start substituting his or her judgment for what comes up in the end. And it was, uh, and, and the, the trouble, as I said earlier on, is it, it, the idea that every medic agrees, you usually find with new diseases, I mean, I've never been the only one I've ever been involved with, but the new disease, presumably, that there's, we, it's from COVID, it's became obvious as the COVID thing's gone along. There's a range of opinions, even amongst the experts, about exactly what's going on or what's likely to happen. With That's resolved in, you know, things like the obscure subcommittee we were talking about yesterday. It's the, the medics and the scientists go to the best... The colleagues they want to consult, they do the best they can to explore what's happening, and then they put up to the ministers, the laymen, the consensus they've reached in the end and what the line to take is. And of course, you find outliers, you found this Mr. Galbraith yesterday. But in the end, uh, if the balance of opinion is X, or you know, if they decide as a team that is the best they can do. That is what they put to ministers. And that's where no conclusive proof came from. And until the medics changed their advice, it would have been positively irresponsible for a minister to change the use of the words. Did you ever challenge your officials on why this phrase was being used? Oh, I can't remember. D do you think you would have asked your officials, is it Well, if likely? I doubted it, but it seems to me, it seems to me now a perfectly accurate description of the position we were in then. I mean, it's a strong... It's, it, when you look at the other sentences with it, what the government was then saying was a strong possibility, a strong probability, perhaps, that it's being caused, but there's no conclusive evidence, so we can't be certain or sure. But the government was actually implementing a policy, the only really strong precaution we could take so far as British blood donation was concerned, asking gays to stop giving blood. Let, let's just put back on the screen, please, the two statements, Shamik. So can we have side by side DHSC 000 6401 underscore 006 and then PRSE 
40886. Did this go out in my name, this one? They're the documents we've already looked at, Lord Clark. Um, oh, it is. And now yes, it, it quotes my announcement. just want to go back to the language that was used. So if we look on the left-hand side, the, the press release, um, there's a reference uh, uh, to, uh, um, and this is five lines down, in, uh, four lines down into it, possible risk of transmission. We must continue to minimise any possible risk of transmission. It, it's right, isn't it, that there's no reference there to probable or likely? Well, obviously, what we've got to do is read it. Yes, I'm just trying to pick up on it in light of your answers a few moments ago, Lord Clark. And if we look on the right-hand side... I mean, you taking words out of one press release to try to concentrate an answer I've given 40 years later. If you look at the whole thing, the reason for all these documents is this was genuine concern that these American blood products were causing... AIDS, but there was no certainty. There was no medic giving advice that it was certain or sure. And one of the belts we've gone through was setting out the various ways, and there are very limited ways, in which this risk could be minuted. And actually, this is quite a dramatic step we were taking. I mean, it's, it, 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 the reason we were worried about the tone, it's hardly surprising that the popular press took off we were telling gays who were the victims of a very great deal of public prejudice at that time to stop, you know, asking them to consider, stop giving blood and things. Now, it's, it's no good taking one phrase out of my answer and then pointing to one word in a press release you found from 1983. I think I've, I'm answering the same question over and over again, but it's perfectly bloody obvious. Uh, what we were doing, and we know perfectly well from all the evidence yesterday what the state of play was as far as the risks were concerned. And using it was the agreed, but presumably medical advice by the collectively, the lot of them, that we should use the phrase as no conclusive proof, and the ministers carried on using it until we were advised to stop using it. Lord Clark, you, you may also um, you may think it's also perfectly obvious with, with, with or without an epithet attached that the phrase probable or likely is not used in your written parliamentary answer. It's not. Well, I can see that. Anyone who reads that can see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm great. Pointless question. Um, why? Um, well, we're not going to go on all day like this, are we? Doesn't this inquiry wish to reach a conclusion? So, I don't know how many years you've been going. Extraordinary. Um, might it be said, Lord Clark, that you and the department repeatedly using the line to take of no conclusive proof were not being straightforward and candid with the public because you were not acknowledging the likely causal connection between AIDS and blood products? But the word, the word doesn't say... The, 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 the line to take did not say uh, 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 blood products don't cause AIDS. It doesn't say that at all. That would be quite wrong, inaccurate, untrue. The, the, the meaning, in, in my opinion, if you give the ordinary meaning of the words, there's no conclusive proof. And if you look at the sentences around it, it is quite clear we're saying you know, there's a strong possibility, at least, that it causes AIDS. Uh, and But there is, at the moment no conclusive proof. We might find that, presumably it implies, haemophiliacs are acquiring it in some other way. I mean, and that doesn't just mean sexual activity. That would, for some peculiar reason, turn out to be some other way in which haemophiliacs... That's, that, I mean, it's not my... It's not, I'm not, I used it, but it's not my medical opinion. That is what... I'm using the English language. This is how I interpret the phrase. Uh, and, and if you look at the whole documents... That is plainly what the department was saying, and I'm convinced that was, it doesn't matter, we're individual doctors, that was the collective view of the scientific experts in the department and those they consulted outside. 
I'm going to invite you to consider giving a yes or no answer to this question, Lord. I'm giving you long answers, I know, and I'm getting exasperated okay. far too early in the morning, but it's quite obvious what there is no Was the department being less than straightforward and candid in pursuing the no conclusive proof line to take? Most definitely not. It's an absurd tabloid newspaper spin you're putting on it. What was the purpose, in your view, of expressing the government, the department's line to take in those terms? The purpose was to do the best we could to inform people of an alarming situation, which was and explaining why we were taking such a drastic step as telling homosexuals, please, to stop giving blood. Which, as you see from other documents, one of the things we were all concerned, we did not want to feed homophobic reactions to all this. Hence my disgust, really, at some newspaper putting a headline, Docs Ban Gay Blood, which shows how little they were taking notice of uh, these sensitivities. Was the no conclusive proof line to take designed to encourage haemophiliacs to continue with their treatment? That was, the, that was the advice of their doctors. It was their doctors who decided. Obviously, they would have the consent of the patient. It was the experts in haemophilia medicine. The doctors, usually in expert centres, who were treating them, who advised them and allowed them to carry on taking blood products, including factor eight more than half of which, I think, was imported from America. With respect, Lord Clark, that's not an answer to the question. I'll repeat the question. Was the line to take of no conclusive proof designed, in part, to encourage haemophiliacs to continue with their treatment? No, not particularly. It was, it was the best explanation we could give of the risk that was making us take this precautionary step. Was it designed in part to allay public concern or avoid panic? Yeah, I assume, you'll have to ask whoever was the author. I don't know which, you know, which meeting, which, where, where, where the, I didn't, I didn't invent the phrase. I don't know where the phrase came from when it was put in front of me, but it strikes me as, as, a, as a layman, a non-medic, as a 100% accurate description of where we then were. When we look at DHSC 0002375 underscore 034, please. This is not a document from your time in office, Lord Clark. Um, this is a minute dated the 20th of October 1987, um, uh, uh, and it, um, it attaches a detailed chronology prepared in collaboration with Dr Smithers... Uh, and then if we go to DHSC 0002375 underscore 035. Yep. We'll see the chronology. Uh, I want to invite your attention to two parts of it. The first I don't think I've ever seen this before, have I? Well, it's been provided to you in advance of you giving evidence, Lord Clark, whether you've read it or not. Well, I've got thousands and thousands, answer. folder on folder of that. Um, so if we look at page, so paragraph two, it says throughout 1983, the government's public line in private office cases and parliamentary replies was that there was no conclusive evidence that AIDS was transmitted by blood products. This statement was strictly true, and in view of the very small number of UK cases, was intended to reduce public anxiety. Uh, do, is, is, is that your view of, of what, what in part the purpose of the statement was? Well, whoever, did, whoever produced this had done some research into the background to it all. So reducing public anxiety would have been part and parcel of the thinking? Well, well presumably, there was no point, yes, as I was saying yesterday, just causing panic when we, you know, would not have helped at all. But it's not misleading, the phrase, in my opinion. And then if we go, please, to page, page five... Yeah, yeah, you messed out the last bit. When he said little positive action could be taken except by limiting the donors, that was the problem. He set out one of the earlier ones, I admit. Yes. Well, what, what exact? I mean, again, what exactly is it being suggested anybody could have done? Look, 
Cock, I think we, we went over this ground in some detail yesterday afternoon. No, we didn't, oh, really. We went round to the hair-splitting analysis of 40-year-old documents. Well, 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 the, the point we should be getting to is, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, what do we now think should have been done? What uh, could have, what might have been done if only we'd known how big the risk was that would have saved lives? That is what I hope the inquiry is concentrating on, because the purpose of this inquiry is to see if there are any lessons that could be learned if ever the situation arise again in future pandemics. So, as obviously we've spent some years already and had lots of witnesses, there must be arriving at the stage, with, given we have full 100% hindsight now of the tragic death of nearly 3,000 people, what, if they'd known what the risk, what was going to happen, if they'd known what we now know, what might have saved it? What, could have been done. And I think, had we known then what we knew only two years later, the haemophiliac doctors would have stopped using factor eight and would f have faced the storm that would have been faced by, by stopping such a treatment of haemophiliacs doing great damage to the quality of life of the haemophiliacs, but saving their lives. That, that's, that, that, if only we'd realised what the scale of the risk was and how contaminated this American stuff was, I can't think of anything else that might have been done, but as it's quite obvious to the documents, that, that nobody had taken on board that the tragedy that was about to happen was going to happen because it was a new, completely new, unprecedented situation. Law Club, we did go over those issues yesterday afternoon. I know, it seems to me they're the only issues to go over. This, this who said what in a conversation sometime in 1983, great respect, I'm, we may gather, and I'll, I'll shut up and I'll count to ten, and I'll count out. If we're going to spend a day on who said what to whom in a conversation, you know, in June 1983, I shall just have to you know, stop being a grumpy old man. I'm sorry if I'm upsetting, being rather upsetting, but I must uh, just settle down and answer the damn questions, most of which I can't remember, because I can't remember who said what in conversations, and I can't remember these documents until you put them in front of me. Look, 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 look it, it may assist. If you listen to the question and answer the question, it, it may be a quicker process. If we look at paragraph 13... I've, on the whole, answered the same questions over and over again. Well, I don't think this is a question I've asked you yet, Lord Clark, so if I may. <coughs> we have no record of any public utterance from the government which acknowledged the infectivity of Factor Eight until the 20th of December 1984. D does that surprise you, Lord Clark, that although the l no conclusive proof is abandoned at some stage in, by March of 1984, um, there's it was no abandoned in March 1984. I'll, I'll show you the documents in a moment, Lord Clark. Um, uh, does it surprise you that the, there's no public utterance acknowledging factor eight as, as an infectious agent until that's that point? Surprising. In, time? Mm. Um, in terms of the abandonment of the line to take, um, I, we'll just show and, you. The, and then it's in December, is it, that the chief medical officer actually does publicly refer to heat treatment because that that was the other thing that came too late, but that would have saved lives if we'd had heat treatment earlier. But I don't know where it came from, which scientists, which research produced heat treatment, which stopped it being infectious. Um, if we look at PRSC 0001580, Um, Lord Clark, this is a newspaper article from the 25th of March 1984. This is actually from a version that appears in the Department of Health's own files. Um, and you'll see uh, it reports um, uh, in the first paragraph, uh, transfusion, this is in the States, uh, transmission of AIDS to a hospital patient through a blood transfusion. Um, if we go... And it's from Los Angeles. It, the, it is. Um, um, I'm just showing you that because it's the context for, for, for the next document, 
which is DHSC 0002239 underscore 089. Sorry, can I just have a look at this press yes, release? Seems nothing else. No, keep, 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 keep that on there. Perhaps if we go towards the bottom of the, the, the page. Um, if you look at the, the last two paragraphs in the left-hand mm -hmm. column, Lord Clark, um, you'll see it says, this is referring to the States, most of the victims are homosexual men who contracted AIDS through sexual contact, but at least 70 people who had blood transfusions, either haemophiliacs or hospital patients, some of them babies, the suspicion that the blood was to blame. So they're in the same position in America. The suspicion that the blood was to blame has now, March 1984, become proof. Well, that's what, the, that's, that's what a journalist is saying. That's what the Sunday Times says. I have no reason to doubt that. Um, it, so it, they, before that, they'd been in the same position that we were. Well, I think the fact of people becoming infected through transfusions or blood products... Well, I think, it, if I may say so, it's, I think it's relevant to ask what other countries were doing, because there were whole lots of ministers and whole lots of doctors facing exactly the same problem across Western Europe and most particularly in the United States, where it all came from. Very good point, Lord Clark. Did, did you ever ask in your time as Minister? No, I don't think I ever did, because I wasn't the Minister responsible for this, but I was handling it with hindsight. It might have been a good idea to have asked. Would you have expected those questions to be asked at least within the department, leaving aside the question of who? I have no it? idea. Well, you better ask the people who, the, say, the medics there. Well, no. But, but it's, uh, I presume you've done a lot of research on what was being done in other countries in the in, course indeed. of this inquiry. I'm, I'm not asking you what, as a matter of fact, what discussions did take place on that issue, because I well, don't I, know. Well, I didn't ask. The answer is no, I didn't ask at the time. Yeah. Perhaps for looking back, I wish I had. Would you... My question... We were told the Americans were taking steps, quite understandably, to try to improve the... Say, they, they, they were as worried as we were, I'm sure. So they were taking steps to try to solve this problem with their blood products because the Americans were treating American patients with the same stuff that we were treating British statements. And America is not a backward country in medical terms. I'm sure the American medical establishment was making pretty desperate efforts to try to minimize the risk. And if this is correct, and I have no reason to doubt it, they, they became certain that this was how people were getting AIDS in March 1984. Um, would you have expected that the department would be investigating what was happening in other countries? Well, they might, yes. As I said, it's too easy. It's too easy for us all to sit here and say, oh, of course I'd expect them to do that. This is the wisdom of hindsight 40 years later. We had no idea. Probably on either side of the Atlantic, the stale of the catastrophic tragedy that was about to hit thousands of people. Um, if we go to DHSC 0002239 underscore 089, this is, again, this is a note written in the Department of Health files, and our understanding is that it's, it's associated with the, the newspaper article. Um, but what it actually says is, we dropped there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted through blood or blood products from our standard line some time okay. ago. Um, do, do you have any knowledge or recollection, Lord Clark, of the circumstances in which, or the reasons for which no, that line is dropped? No, I do not. I say I don't know which, where the, the phrase was first drafted. I, I don't have any recollection of when or how it was dropped or how ministers were advised to drop it. I, can't, I just can't remember after all this time. Do, do, do we can take that down, thank you. Um, do, do you accept, Lord Clark, that the line to take should have included express recognition of the likelihood, the probability, that AIDS could be transmitted through blood and blood products? Well... Every time you've used it, it's in a context where it's quite obvious that that likelihood, that possibility, was exactly why we were taking the actions we were taking. I mean, <coughs> it's a drafting point. Do you accept, Lord Clark, I'm going to repeat the question because I'm not sure you've answered it, that the line to take should have included an express recognition of the likelihood or probability that AIDS could be transmitted through blood or blood. Oh, really? I said, that's perfectly bloody obvious that everybody was working on that basis. It's just, this is a, just a drafting argument. Th 
that these are the statements that your department elected yeah, to I make know. to the public. And there's no, there's no the secrecy. Parliamentarians. There, there's no secrecy the about the fact. There's a serious worry that people might be getting AIDS from blood products. That's, that's hundreds of documents are concerned with that very problem, and every statement to the public, it's quite obvious as the press were interpreting it quite clearly. It's quite obvious what is causing the concern. It is accurate, it seems to me, unless you can find some medical opinion I've never seen before. Seems to me, having looked at these documents, it, the no conclusive proof phrase, these three words are taken out as though they're loaded with significance. The three no conclusive proof is a perfectly accurate description of the then medical opinion. And, and to, to start making arguments by taking three words out of context, out of a paragraph, uh, and then when the three words, it seems to me you can't demonstrate they're inaccurate, we've spent half an hour on this. I, I think you, I you know. know. When tabloid journalists do this, they don't usually take half an hour labouring it with the greatest respect. Uh, I think by now I, I have Lord Clark's answer very clearly in my so. head. Um, going to turn on to the question of AIDS screening tests um, uh, and the introduction of those. Uh, so this is, this is testing blood donations for AIDS. Yeah, I remember all that. Um, if we just pick matters up, um, and I'm going to show you a handful of documents just so that we can see the chronology and, and then ask you some questions about them. We can pick matters up, I think... Um, uh, at DHSC 40445. Um, this and, is and who is this to? This is, who is it addressed to? Is it's it? addressed to Dr. Smithers, who was yeah. Dr. Wolford's successor. And these people... Um, and, and it, it, it's really, you, you, you may not have seen this particular document, but it's really just to help us start looking at the chronology, Lord Clerk. So it's okay, the 31st cool. of okay. July, 1984. It, it refers to a discussion of a, of a meeting, n no suggestion that you would have been present, Lord, Lord Clerk, um, uh, on the 31st of July. Uh, and we can just see, picking it up in the second uh, paragraph. That's 1984. Y yes, so, I'm so sorry, Lord Clerk. So, yes. I'm sorry, when in 1984? Um, it was agreed... This is the second paragraph that ministers should be made aware of the arrangements to screen all blood donors at North West London start in October. Mm -hmm. Regional Transfusion Centre to start in October. Um, and then there's reference to there being um, an, a note um, to, uh, um, to go up to ministers. So uh, you'll see from this in around the middle of 1984, the possibility of screening uh, was being uh, discussed within the department. But there wasn't, by this stage, I think, uh, a test which had been developed, which could be relied upon. Again, it's just like COVID. Um, you, you can't really make much progress with testing and screening until you're satisfied that the test is safe and that the test is reasonably it's accurate to the required degree. Uh, it's no good having false pos large numbers of false positives and false negatives. And that, again, is always a question of the progress of medical research. Yes, and we'll, we'll come on to that. It, it, I, I'm just, as I say, want to just try and, try, try and w work through what was being seen when. So if we go to DHSC 40443. This is a minute of the 31st of August 1984. Um, uh, to to um, uh, Mr. Cash and Mr. Joyce, um, uh, and it's a briefing note... Um, so here being sent, <coughs> I think, to Lord Glenarthur's private office rather than, uh, I think, your own. And then if we just look over the page, um, and this is to understand the state of knowledge within the department rather than your own, Lord Clark, publication of a paper in The Lancet and The Guardian on the use of a screening test for AIDS devised by teams at the Institute of Cancer Research in the Middlesex Hospital. Ministers are aware, this is under the heading summary, from the AIDS leaflet submission, which you had seen, that a blood test for AIDS antibody is under development. Uh, this background note provides further briefing to cover publication in the Lancet of a paper on the results of the use of this blood screening test. 
um, and, and then there's um, reference to uh, aspects of the Guardian article being uh, misleading. Um, and then we can see further down, there's, there's a description of the test. I'm not going to go through the details of that. Go to the top of the next page. We can see under the heading, the results. Um, uh, it talks about the results of the um, test seeming to confirm that individuals suffering from AIDS and a high percentage of those who may be developing AIDS itself or a milder form of the disease carry an antibody in their blood. And then bottom of the page. It says it is not yet known what this means. Use of the test in the UK to ensure our blood donations are free of the risk of causing AIDS. The preliminary reports of the use of the test are very encouraging in that they show that none of the 1,000 UK blood donors tested carried any antibody to AIDS. Let's hope this test will be extended as we learn more about its meaning to a larger number of donors. It's in a very early stage of development and the reagents necessary to carry out the test are in short supply. And then there's a reference to um, uh, trying to address that situation. And then heading conclusion, officials consider the identification of the presence of the antibody should not be a cause for alarm, but rather is positive proof that useful research and development of this test is going ahead with the ultimate aim of an increase in knowledge of this condition and the protection of our UK blood supply. So we'll clock that, that, that's what the, the understanding within the department is at the end of August of 1984. Um, I then want to show you one more document that you... Yes, re research and development of the test was going ahead. I just want to show you one more document again that you wouldn't have seen at the time before we look at then at your own involvement. So DHSC 0101679. Sorry, this is who, who's this from and who's this to? Um, sorry, this might be the wrong reference. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's from, it, again, it's not copied to you. It's 26th of October 1984, but in fact, it's not, I think. I don't know. I think no, it may be the right one. So if we, it, it's, it's um, from a Mr. Williams, I think, to a Mr. Staniforth. Um, yes, it does provide the background for the documents I want to ask you about. So if we look at the heading, blood test for AIDS, bid for £2 million for 1985 to 1986. Um, as discussed by telephone with Mr Lillywhite, the relative impression of our bid, guesstimate of £1 per test and times £2 million donations per annum, should not be confused with the high priority which we attach to the need for such a test. At present, a UK test is being developed, and it is known that a USA commercial test or tests is likely to be launched soon. It is thus almost certain that some tests will be available by the start of the financial year 1985 to 1986. The departments will be unable to resist pressure, and, um, and indeed on policy grounds would support the move, to introduce a test to show that every blood donation, whether for... Immediate. Immediate blood Immediate. transfusion and or subsequent manufacture of blood products is free from AIDS contamination. It is anticipated that ministers, to secure the credibility and reputation of the National Blood Transfusion Service and BPL's blood products, will wish to instruct regional health authorities, regional transfusion centres to adopt the new test. Presentationally, this would be better done with offers of funding assistance rather than as the imposition of a ministerial priority to be funded from within RAWP allocation. So you'll see there, Lord Clark, that what's being said within the department is um, support for the introduction of a test, um, wanting to instruct regional transfusion centres at the appropriate stage to adopt that, the but the suggestion there that, that there should be some central funding is... is the issue being canvassed in this document, would you accept that? Uh, this particular document, yeah, that's what you suggest. It's, it, it, they're discussing making a bid yes, for central funding. Yes, a bid. And, and it's, that's what I want to then ask you about, because the bid does come uh, to your attention. So if we look at WITN 0758011... Um, 
This is a minute. It's addressed to Miss Bateman, who was in your private office, yes? Is that right, floor clerk? Sorry, is this? Addressed to Miss Bateman. Miss Bateman, yes, I think she was Sarah Bateman was in my office. And if we go to the fourth page, we'll see the date. Bottom of the page, 31st of October 1984. If we go back to the first page, we'll see in the first paragraph, this submission seeks ministers' views on the level of HCHS central reserves for 1985 to 1986. Um, and there are then various um, possible uh, um, or anticipated bids set out. I'm not going to go through most of them, which are unrelated. To well, it's, 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 it's always the whole day-to-day -day operation of health policy and the health service, always competing bids for finite resources. You know, and they're perfectly worthwhile. Demands for bids just rise all the time. You're like running upwards on a downward going escalator all the time. There's perfectly worthwhile ways of spending money are presented to you. You have to choose which ones you're going to spend. And if we go to the third page and look at the top of the page, paragraph eight, um, we'll see um, reference to some new bids. Um, uh, and I'm going to pick it up in the fourth line. HS Division have advised that the proposed central funding of AIDS tests when a testing technique is developed before 1985 to 86, will be politically difficult to resist, though the cost estimate of two million pounds is provisional only. And then it goes on to talk about other, other, other bits. Um, so that, that's the information being provided to you in the submission. Um, and then if we look at um, the discussion. Yes, it's giving opinions on various competing bids. Yes. We look at the discussion, or such record of it as we have, at DHSC 00023090052. And we can see from the top of the page, note of a meeting to discuss HCHS central reserves held 13th of November 1984, present, and we see that you, um, uh, Lord Clark, were present as MSH. The meeting considered Mrs. Banks's submission of the 31st of October. That's the document we've just looked at. The following decisions were reached with regard to the level and areas of expenditure of the central revenue and capital programmes, and then various ones um, are either agreed or not agreed. Uh, and then we can see bottom of the page the heading new bids. Um, the following new bids were agreed, and um, um, a number there set out. And then if we go over the page... We can see at four it says it was agreed not to make provision for the following. Um, and then the fifth item there is AIDS tests. Hypothetical, additional should be expenditure for regions not central preemption. Yes, the transfusion service was organised on a regional basis. So is it right to understand from this that the, that the bid for central funding for the AIDS tests that we saw referred to in the earlier documents was rejected on two grounds, hypothetical and... Um, hypothetical means we haven't got a test yet. That was, uh, I assume, I take it, that's what it means. As I, mean, I don't know what it means, but that's what I assume it means. And, and, and why was it the, your view or the meeting's view that... Well, presumably, I can't remember. I, I mean, look, if you look at... You're asking me to remember the details of a meeting where we discussed, even on this little bit, special medical developments, central cleaning clearing uh, scheme, that should be. Uh, pr pr problems arising with primary care, green paper, the thrombosis research unit, blood products at Hammersmith ha Hospital. I'm afraid I can't remember, firstly, how much we discussed in detail. This was all based on the recommendations of the so-called management group in the department who did all the detailed work. And then you wind up <coughs> with a meeting at which I, because I was responsible for these financial things, but it's no good asking me if you go through all the items in this document, do I remember who said what or how we arrived at the conclusion. It is merely my guess, 40 years later, that we came to that conclusion because, you know, the regional transfusion directors and their teams, the, 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 we did organize the, the thing regionally. 
So the regional health authority budget should be the place you look for the money. Uh, there seems to be no suggestion that anybody was not going to buy AIDS tests if we did develop one that worked. And, and can you recall more, more generally, I understand you can't recall the particular meeting or the particular item, but can you recall more generally, was, was there a, a, an established practice or approach as to the kind of criteria that would be used to decide if something was going to be centrally funded or regional? Well, I mean, there's a whole variety of judgments. It's very difficult. You say the, pro the, the problem of health policy, I imagine in every, ever since the health service was founded, is the terribly difficult choices you have to make between competing priorities. You, I said, any given stage, I'm sure it's true, for my successors as minister, even as we speak, there are some lots and lots of worthwhile bids to spend more money, an ever-mounting pile of irresistible ones that you've got to allow because of clinical advance. And you have a whole management team, you have lots of discussions in the department, finally you have ministerial meetings, and some you can do now. Some are going to have to wait until you see how much you can get out of the Treasury for next year. That's the day-to-day -day process of management of giant organisation like the National Health Service. Um, sir, so we've got to nearly quarter past, and the next series of documents might take a little longer, so perhaps the right moment for a morning break. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll uh, take a break. I'm sorry if I'm getting exasperated. I'll take a break and have a coffee and try to behave more reasonably. But it's uh, this really is extraordinary process, in my opinion. Well, it, it's going to if, if, I, if I may, Lord Clark, uh, the process involves looking at, as is inevitable at documents from the past, of which, because it is so far in the past in many cases, there are few people left who can tell us what actually happened, sure. if, if they can remember. You've told us repeatedly uh, that you can't remember. I've got that picture. Um, uh, but if you do remember, it would be very helpful to have that memory. If you can't remember, you can't remember. And uh, I shall look at the document and draw conclusions from, from that. But that's the nature of the process. Uh, and you're here because you can, you were there, and you are still available to answer questions. Uh, and that's why uh, we've trespassed on your time to no, be here. So uh, enjoy your coffee, and we'll see you at... Uh, Quarter to twelve. But all I can say is, if anybody tells you they remember why a particular conclusion was reached on one item in that consideration of central financing, I would say don't believe them.